Right. Thank you very much. I'm David Kowski, and I'm just about ready to get started here. Yeah, so we're going to talk about building microservices from the start at Telnix. I've uh, been an engineer at Telnix for about two and a half years, and just sitting here before the talk, uh, I was thinking about how far we've come. It's been pretty amazing, pretty fun, and I'm excited to be up here talking about our kind of journey from where we started to, or where I started with Telnix uh, to where we are today. So I've been working on the Mission Control API for about two and a half years, and I'm kind of at the edge of the boundary of the internet and the public-facing API, and uh, we started that with microservices, and it's been a really cool ride. So first, uh, real quick, what is the Telnix Mission Control API? You can see some clients of it at the top here. We've got our portal, our API docs let you interact directly. Um, Cisco Meraki interacts directly with our API in order to facilitate their customers being able to make phone calls. And then our customers also write client scripts that hit our API. And anytime anything hits our API, it makes changes in our system that facilitate phone calls connecting and text messages sending and so on. So, you know, everything from billing to fraud detection, E911 settings, et cetera, et cetera, can be done through our API and, uh, you know, help the customers with their telecom needs. So why am I giving this talk? Again, um, you know, it's, it's been a really interesting ride at Telnix. Uh, microservices are a hot thing. They were a hot thing two and a half years ago and they're a hot thing now. Anybody building or maintaining any significant software system today should be thinking about microservices um, from the beginning, whether it works for you or not, you sh should at least be thinking about it, in my opinion. And, you know, there are pros and cons that ultimately depend on your specific circumstances and tools and practices continue to evolve. So, you know, I'm here to kind of tell our story and hopefully it will um, inform you uh, when you go back next week or tonight, um, whenever you go back to, to your day job, and hopefully it will inform uh, what you do next in, in your role. So here's a quick roadmap. We've already covered the intro. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why we built microservices from the start at Telnix. We're going to go through the early days, some of the benefits and drawbacks we saw, and then finally a, a quick section on what we're going to be doing next as our system continues to evolve. And at the end, we'll save a little bit of time for questions and answers. So why did we build microservices from the start? Um, the first answer is we were replacing a known legacy system. It was not as complicated as what we have today, but the, the more knowledge you have about your software system from the start, the easier it is to start out with microservices. Uh, so that was, that was the first reason. Uh, another reason is that we have a lot of very specialized systems, so already, you know, just the modularity of what we were doing, um, you know, and just having so many um, specialized systems. And of course, this is not a comprehensive list here. Um, that's, that's another good indicator that microservices might be a good idea. And downtime, probably like all of us here, downtime's not an option for us. So microservices make deploys a lot easier. They make code changes less risky. They make scaling up a lot easier and maintaining scale a lot easier. So, you know, that always looked like a really good idea for us. So, um, and then one more, we were, you know, we've been fortunate that we've always been able to deliberately optimize for the long term. And to us, that means, you know, that meant some upfront investment that's paying off very well for us now. Uh, and, you know, that fits hand in hand with uh, microservices. So that was why we built microservices from the start. Now we're going to talk about you know some of the early days and some of the some of those you know upfront investments that we had to make. So building your first microservices, like I said, say, takes time, and here are some of the things that uh, slowed us down in the beginning. Integration and communication between services. It might sound simple, but there are decisions to make here, and we had to make those decisions, and we knew we had to live with them for a long time. We couldn't just experiment. You know, when you're breaking down a monolith, you can do some experiments and see what works for you and what doesn't. But you know, these big early decisions were higher stakes for us. 
So, you know, they're non-trivial. We had to choose data format. Um, were we going to communicate between services asynchronously or synchronously? Um, asynchronous, asynchronously is nice because we can respond from the API back to the client very quickly and then just let, uh, let changes propagate through the system. And, and that's great in a lot of cases. But, um, you know, the best example of when that's not great is if you're configuring E911 settings, uh, any error handling, we have to do that right away. So uh, that w we do that synchronously, and we do some other things synchronously too. So in the end here, we decided to, you know, to kind of do a hybrid of asynchronous communication with RabbitMQ, synchronous with H uh, HTTP calls, and then using JSON as the data transport. And we're continuing to evolve that. And then uh, service boundaries. Service boundaries were the biggest reason that, or the, the best argument that I could find against doing microservices from the start. Um, if, you're, uh, if you get the service boundaries wrong, then that can be a huge problem. If you're outgrowing a monolith, you definitely have a problem. And you know, if you get to the point where you've built a monolith and now you need to break it down, yeah, that's a problem. But if you instead find that you've done microservices, now you're billing services strewn across five services, and maybe those are in five different languages, and now you need to extract all of that, then you have at least five problems instead of one. So that was, that was the biggest thing that we wanted to avoid was messing up the service boundaries. And the solution to that was you know, just moving forward as fast as we could, because that's what we do, but also just erring on the side of building monoliths within microservices architecture. And that just kept us moving forward. Um, you know, to me, if you know, it's nice to be able to ship products and get your microservice boundaries exactly right. But in the end, you get to pick one of those. And we wanted to ship product, and you know, we also wanted microservices, so we gave up making them perfect from day one. And and that's worked out really well for us. So another thing, um, you know, here's an illustration of the service boundaries that I'm talking about. So this will be an illustration of a number order, and we've got the Telnix portal, you know, so that's a client outside calling into our API. And that's gonna hit our Rails API, which, you know, is, is the service that we've always had at the front um, until more recently. So it hits the Rails API, the Rails API authenticates and authorizes the request, validates the request, and, you know, assuming everything is good there, then it's gonna push that, um, it's gonna push an update to RabbitMQ, and then RabbitMQ is gonna, you know, asynchronously push updates to billing, telephony, numbers, and anybody else who subscribes to a message um, about a number order. So, you know, the, the data gets there eventually, Rails API doesn't have to know, you know, who's listening, but everything works out in the end. And that's great, but we'll get back to this slide in a little bit um, and talk about some of the downsides of, of how we did that. And then, you know, another thing about the early days is that infrastructure was absolutely critical from the very beginning. Um, there's a whole lot of work here to, to get it right. And, you know, my the main takeaway, like I'm not on the infrastructure team, I really, really, really appreciate our inf infrastructure team. Um, don't underestimate it if you're gonna do microservices. And then once you have it, once you um, have high availability automated deploys and a great CI pipeline and monitoring, alerting, and so on, um, you get all these things for free every time you uh, create a new service and push it into production. There's really very little incremental cost to, um, you know, to getting all these things. So that's great. And you know, the takeaway from this slide is don't take your infrastructure team for granted. <laughs> And uh, so that's the early days, and then we'll get into some of the benefits and drawbacks that we've seen at Telnix now. So a great benefit has been language agnosticism. We, um, uh, you know, the best example or my favorite example is that, you know, you saw, we saw the Rails API there, and that's what I, you know, originally worked on at Telnix. And what's been really nice is Elixir starts looking really interesting to us. So it was really easy to say, well, let's you know, let's do a simple service in Elixir, and let's see how that goes. And 
it's been a great success and now we're doing most of the things that we would have done new in Ruby before we can now do an Elixir and, and that's been wonderful. We also have Python, Java, Scala, Go, and several other um, languages in production. And just right now, like just this week, we've been finding that Elixir might not be the best tool for dealing with an external silk service. And again, um, you know, if, if, if it gets really terrible, then we can just say, okay, well that service is not gonna be an Elixir, maybe that makes more sense in Java or, or another language. So that's been really nice. And, and again, if you're doing a, if you have a monolith and you wanna change languages or introduce a new language into the, your environment, that can be much more difficult or, or where you, um, your ability to roll it out or you know where that language can live in your environment is, is obviously much more limited unless you're gonna completely re rewrite your system. Structure, um, I think I covered that pretty well on the earlier slide, but again, it's um, that was a lot of work up front, a lot of hard work up front, and it's paying huge dividends for us now. And then, you know, huge benefit right now, of course, um, this is kind of a good problem to have breaking down a huge monolith, but the fact that we're not right now is just, that's, that's much better. Um, it, at our current scale and at our current feature set and our current roadmap, um, this would be a huge problem if, if we had built a monolith, we'd be breaking it down right now instead of, uh, you know, moving forward on a roadmap, and that would be pretty difficult for us, or you know, it just wouldn't be as fun. <laughs> so fun, um, it's been a lot of fun, and it's been fun in the sense that we're making progress, and we're you know we're shipping product, and we've got um, you know people happy with our platform, and it's it's been great. It's not just like, hey, this is a cool thing. I'm an engineer. I'm going to go look at this for a while. It's been like just the right combination of all the things kind of fun. And then, so th those are some of the benefits. Now we'll get into some of the drawbacks. Those, you know, I mentioned earlier that, you know, that initial um, initial development was, you know, kind of slowed down by the decisions that we had to make early on. And, and those were, you know, pretty high stake. And, you know, again, the how our process is going to um, communicate with each other, were we gonna use Docker or not? Um, you know, all, all of these things kind of slowed us down in the beginning. And again, we had the, the you know, benefit of being able to optimize for the long term. So that's been really good for us, but you know, that's, that's something to be aware of. Um, if you're gonna start with microservices for the first time, it definitely will slow you down. So our solution there was just, you know, this sounds, hand wavy, push through while balancing several factors. We just had to iterate and, you know, keep pushing and, and you know, balance balance shipping products against, um, you know, doing this as best as we could. And I, I think we did pretty well with that. And then another drawback was um, integration, especially in the early days when you have a system that's not in production at all yet and you're working in your service and somebody else is working on the same feature in another service. It's just super tempting to say, yeah, this thing works in my service, so I'm gonna move on and it's done. And that would have been a disaster at the end when we thought that all the things were done in all the services and it was time to ship and we found out that nothing was talking to each other correctly. So that was just something that we had to be really aware of early on and the solution was just to, to say that nothing's done at all until it's usable. And uh, we didn't measure progress by done in my service, but you know, had to work end to end uh, was the only way that we would measure, pro that the only acceptable way that we measured progress. And then uh, another drawback was that we aired on the side of monoliths within micro our microservices architecture. So here's a, an illustration and you know, this is the diagram from earlier and we have synchronous and asynchronous calls, but now you see the Rails API is red because that became kind of our monolith. It, um, every time we needed to add a feature or change something, it turned out that we had to change the Rails API as well. And so that, um, that's a clear indication in a microservices architecture that you've got something doing too much. So we're breaking it down as we evolve. It, it hasn't been an awful problem. Um, we did gain consistent API user experience from the start because all the API interactions originally went through that Rails API. Um, but we're, we're working on that and we'll discuss that further uh, in the next section. Another drawback is that every service has its own view of the world based on imperfect data. And here's an illustration where we have another number order coming in. 
And so number order from the portal on the left hits the Rails API, hits RabbitMQ, hits the billing service, hits the telephony service, but for whatever reason, the message dropped and never got reflected in the number service. So that's, you know, that's obviously a big problem because now the numbers inventory is wrong and it might return that number again in search results even though somebody owns it. Our current solution is automated discrepancy checks and then manual intervention, but again, we'll um, talk more about where we're going on that in the next section. So that was the benefits and drawbacks, and now we're gonna uh, talk about uh, what's next, you know, where we're heading right now and, and in the in the future. So breaking down the ra uh, Rails monolith, um, We've introduced an API gateway, which handles um, you know, authentication, authorization, and um, request routing to multiple services. So here's an illustration. Now we've got the Rails API in the back a little bit, and request comes into, the, into our API, and it hits our API gateway first. And now the, um, the Rails API is still performing the authentication but you know, again, with a number order, API Gateway asks the Rails API, is this, is this a valid request? Did the user send valid credentials? Rails API says, yes, valid credentials, and now the API Gateway knows that this is a number order, therefore it goes to the number service. Number service publishes a message to RabbitMQ, quickly responds to the API Gateway, and the API Gateway passes, the, um, passes that response back to the client. And then finally, a uh, message come, goes from RabbitMQ to the Rails API so that the Rails API is updated um, with the current state again. So in this way, that's, you know, that's allowed us to break out our number searching and ordering. And we're continuing to, to break out more and more services because we've put this API gateway in front where we used to have just the Rails API. And by the way, the API gateway is an Elixir service, so that's one example of where Elixir has been really good for us. So then another thing that we're, um, that we're pushing pretty hard towards right now is event sourcing. So, you know, again, the problem of a RabbitMQ message, you know, maybe reaching one or more services but not reaching all of the services or also just um, maybe RabbitMQ message gets there but it gets there late. Uh, it, it can make it hard to recreate the state of the system or, or to figure out what was the exact state of the system at any given time. So what we're working on, so here, here's you know, a, a really good motivation for, uh, for event sourcing. We've got the reporting, and the reporting system is you know, trying to listen to these messages going through the system, and you know, there's, there's some uncertainty. And you know, meanwhile, number orders are, are going in like we've gone through a couple of times now in these diagrams. So the idea with event sourcing is to replace uh, RabbitMQ with, whoops, with an event log. And that, you know, uh, the, uh, the event log is, is basically an ordered immutable log of events so that, um, you know, and you can, um, you can tombstone it daily or, you know, however often you need to, but, but the idea is that you play those, um, you can recreate the entire state of your system at any given point in time where you can move the log backwards and see what was the state of the system at any point in time based on that immutable sequence of events. And that's, um, that's gonna be important for us uh, in the near future, so we're pushing hard towards that. And then finally, GraphQL looks um, very interesting as we scale up uh, number of services and engineering headcount. Uh, we're going to we're going to have a lot of very specialized services now. GraphQL obviously looks very interesting right now for a lot of reasons, whether you're doing a monolith or not. But but especially for us, as we scale up um, team size and number of services, it um, it's going to be very helpful for us to to be able to just go say, hey, the data that I need is over there in some service that I don't even know who works on it and. Um, but I can just go to this UI and I can say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to get their email and I'm going to get the, the user's numbers and, and, you know, are those numbers active? So this is just a very quick proof of concept that I threw together a few days ago, um, just kind of illustrating that. And, and then it, it looks like a very interesting thing right now. So that's what I'm very excited about right now. 
And I think that's the last slide. Um, so my colleague Francisco Costello has an upcoming KluCon Weekly that I just wanted to mention real quick. It's about um, out-of-band telephony engine testing and monitoring. And I also just wanted to say, like, I see a lot of my Telnix colleagues here, and uh, thanks a lot for all the help, and it's it's been awesome. So, uh, yeah, it's time for questions. Thank you. Any questions for him? Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, so one advantage of a monolith, um, unless it's um, done in some crazy way, is that when you want to change something, uh, everything that uses that method, if you change the method's uh, name or signature, everything that uses that method will give you a compilation error. In this case, you mentioned that um, Q2 did to list to register owners of services and data, but how are you going to handle consumers? Do you plan to have a database of consumers? So if I have a Reddit MQ event, or an HTTP call, right, that I want to change. How do, how will you know everybody who uses it who will be affected? Does that make sense? I think so. So the, I think the question is, if I change the interface to a service, how will I know what's gonna blow up in production, basically? <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's another thing where GraphQL looks really interesting right now. There are tools that you can, can, uh, use in conjunction with GraphQL that will tell you who's relying on what parts of your data and what parts of your data just nobody even cares about. So, um, you know, this is still something that I need to investigate more thoroughly, so I can't stand up here and pretend that I know a lot about it, but um, but it's, uh, they call it schemaless API. That's like kind of one of their catchphrases, and it sounds great, <laughs> which is why I'm looking into it more. Wonderful. Any other questions? Uh, so, do you do anything with regards to orchestration? Say, uh, in a number ordering API, okay, you, you you put in Rabbit, and it goes to the numbering system, it puts in an account, then it goes in parallel, it's going to the billing system, and the billing system screams up an alarm, this guy has no money. So then you need to go back to all the other systems and roll back. Do you have flows right. to deal with that, and if so, how? Um, so we do, especially, we, we have an automated discrepancy check so that we make sure that billing numbers and the, right now the Rails API all agree as to who owns what numbers. So, you know, of all of our active numbers, if the count is off by one in any one of those systems, then right now it's a manual intervention. Uh, that's something where event sourcing, you know, like, event sort that event log would be the authority like either this thing really happened or it didn't really happen and then we would you know re recreate the and you know the, there can still be manual corrections within an event sourcing system but the idea there would be that you would put in a correcting event you know just like an accounting ledger so you know like you wouldn't go back and say you know in an accounting ledger you wouldn't go back and say no that person didn't really withdraw $100 the other day when you know that they did, but instead you might say, oh, well, here's a credit for $100 because there was some error. So, so you know, in that way, the event log always goes forward, but you can still correct for it. Wonderful. Any final questions? Good. Thank you very much. Let's give a big round of applause to David here.